all the wisdom, for all the knowledge, for all the history that we have of seeing Paul, who loved his people so much that he wanted to go back and constantly drive home the point that made so much sense to him and was so real because he'd been to heaven and he talked to Jesus, but had been so real to him that he wanted to present, as any Jew would, the argument, the literal truth, the reality of the statement of how Jesus had given such a greater gift to mankind than anything that any of the Jewish scholars up until then had ever imagined, that it was so much more than what anyone could believe that he was so excited to share that truth that he wanted to reason because the logic was there. He presents it in such a beautiful way in Hebrews, in Romans, in all the different letters. He has got articulation of a Jewish line of reasoning that goes perfect. And sometimes I go, Ugh. because there are times when I get into discussions with Klal Israel, with the Jewish people that are not saved. And uh, we tend to get excited and go off, except for I state to topic, but unless you're in person with a Jewish person, two Jews discussing things, in trying to post things or write them, they often overrun themselves so much that you don't get a chance to answer each one or to retort or to respond back to any type of line of reasoning or logic that might be given or explained or thrown out so it's a challenge also to write but when i was in jerusalem it was so much fun because i would stand in in the marketplace in the downtown jerusalem and students from out of the the yeshiva would come you know and they'd be there and you know and especially or you know basically orthodox yeshiva students you know it goes without saying but i should say that for the people that don't know but anyways, it was so exciting because I'd start some statement that I knew was going to go in a direction that I wanted it to go, you know, I'm talking about, I never got a chance to get all the way to Jesus, but we'd get pretty far along, you know, and by the time, you know, I'd gotten a certain point, you know, we were all over the place. It looked like a crowd that was, you know, arguing and debating and throwing things up in the air and being excitable. But the joy of sharing the mindset and thought process was such that I could see if only they knew, if only they could take it one step farther and not be closed-minded, not be blinded, not be deaf to the points that were being made and to bring it to the natural conclusion because they never went far enough in the debate or in the argument or in the statements or in the thinking through of what they were saying. And that's what I always pray for, even in Christians today, that we would think through what Jesus said because there's so much more for us to experience that we have not yet seen, heard, or even imagined that God has not only prepared for us, but wants us to have now. If we would just take it extreme, extend it, make it real in your life all the way out to what he is saying, and then it just opens up a whole new universe to you and a whole bunch of people you probably never imagined you might be sharing with. <laughs> in devotionals on Spurgeon. So foolish was I and ignorant. <laughs> I was a beast before you. Psalms. Remember, this is the confession of the man after God's own heart. And in telling us his inner life, he writes, So foolish was I and ignorant. The word foolish here means more than it signifies in ordinary language. David, in a former verse of Psalms, writes, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, which shows that the folly he intended had sin in it. He puts himself down as being thus foolish and adds a word which is to give intensity to it. So foolish was I. How foolish, he could not tell. It was sinful folly, a folly which was not to be excused by frailty, but to be condemned because of its perverseness and willful ignorance for he had been envious of the present prosperity of the ungodly, forgetful of the dreadful end awaiting all such. And are we better than David that we should call ourselves wise? Do we profess that we have attained to perfection or to have so chastened that the rod has taken all our willing willfulness out of us? Ah, this were pride indeed. 
If David was foolish, how foolish should we be in our own esteem if we could but see ourselves? Look back, believer. Think of your doubting God when he had been so faithful to you. Think of your foolish outcry of, No, Lord, not so, my Father, when he crossed his hands in affliction to give you the larger blessing. Think of the many times when you have read his providences in the dark, misinterpreted his dispensations, and groaned out loud, saying, All these things are against me when they are all working together for your good. Think how often you have chosen sin because of its pleasure, when indeed that pleasure was a root of bitterness to you. Surely if we know our own heart, we must plead guilty to the indictment of a sinful folly. And the consciousness of this foolishness, we must make David's consequent result our own. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. You know, I, I do amaze myself sometimes because there are times when I know that once a person or persona or someone has begun on a certain line of reasoning or logic, I know that, well, it doesn't even take much. Within a few sentences, I know where a person's going, what they're going to respond, how they're going to act, what they're going to say, what they're going to do. And it's amazing because we're so predictable. Because not that I hadn't done those things, but because I had done those things and I had been in the place of the shoes of the person that's speaking to me and done the very same things that they seem to be doing, and that I know it's just a matter of education of their process of learning more knowledge and accumulating a better experience with Jesus in a more intimate way that they'll come to the same place that I did. Because in my early days, I had such a wonderful experience in the experiential part that I wanted to know all the knowledge part. And I was like a Solomon who wanted to just ex ex exceed you know, the wisdom of my my betters and my brothers so that i would just keep my nose in the book and study and grow and learn and apply and boy i was like a bookworm to just want to know why and why and why and why of every single thing that i could see of why god don't they know why god didn't they do this why god this and god must have laughed at me knowing how foolish i was to want to know why because in the end if you become someone like me that has a wealth of knowledge with some accumulated wisdom, you recognize what a foolish request it is to be wise. Because the knowledge has to accumulate and then the experience has to participate, otherwise your wisdom is of no worth to anyone except that it causes you frustration and aggravation as opposed to becoming someone else's salvation to share with them about the only way that they'll ever know all that God intends for them which is through Jesus, who is wisdom, knowledge, salvation, propitiation, sanctification, who is our friend, and who could tell us anything we needed to know daily if we would just ask him every day, at any time of the day, what we need to know for that moment, and not what we need to worry about tomorrow. So if I could give you any piece of advice, it's not necessary to be the wisest man in the world. Just the <laughs> most foolish in the sense of trusting him with all your heart, meaning not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledging him and letting him direct your path.